This is a Tibet House member video and is a part of the Force for Good class series, now available at tibethouse.us. Is it, is it possible that sati would mean uh, spiritual memory rather uh, it, than a physical memory from this lifetime in the light of the reincarnation theory of Tibetan Buddhism? Would it not be to awaken our spiritual memory and to remember who we are as spirit rather than an intellectual being or physical being? Yeah, can you all hear the question? Um, I think that's very possible. I think, I think you know, sati as memory means to remember that we're capable of something more than, you know, just being the small person that we usually think we are. Um, so if you want to think about that as spiritual memory, I think that's fine. If you, if you want to think about that as you're remembering something that you learned in a previous lifetime, you know, I think that that could be true. Uh, certainly, it's re remembering that we're spirit, you, you know, as well as body and mind, um, I, it, for sure. But the interesting thing about mindfulness is that it's coming through our minds. You know, it, we are, we, we've been given this mind, um, and encased in this body, and these practices are still you, you know, 2,500 years after the Buddha, 2,600 years after the Buddha, these practices are still being uh, recharged, you know, because they're still, they're, they're still working. They're still, you can just sit down and watch your breath like, well, maybe we'll get to do, and, and it starts to happen. Um, so, yes, I think is the answer to your question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. I was curious to hear how you use those observations that you just uh, read of those teachers yeah. you studied with, and how you use that with people that you are working with. And how, In therapy. Uh, yeah. 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 Let me try to talk about that. That's sort of where I was going to go next, anyway. Um, and then I'll go to the to what you were asking about. Um, I was always leery. Uh, you know, starting my therapy practice, I was always leery of uh, leading too strongly with the Buddhist stuff because I wasn't, some people came to see me because they, they knew I was interested in it and they were interested in it too and they wanted a therapist who didn't think they were crazy for being interested in Buddhism or spirituality in general. But a lot of people just found me randomly and I, uh, and they weren't necessarily looking for spiritual guidance. But but I think the spiritual and the psychological are obviously are really linked. For me, they're really linked. So I was leery about leading with the Buddhist stuff too much. Although the, the book that I've been working on recently is going to be called Advice Not Given, because I, on a recent retreat, I suddenly thought, oh, maybe I was wrong about all of that, and I've been like holding the Buddhist stuff too, you know, too much, too tightly, and I should be like talking about it more. But anyway. So I'm trying to talk about it more in the writing. Um, but early on in my therapy work, I, I uh, discovered Winnicott, uh, who uh, is my favorite psychoanalyst, um, Donald Winnicott, D.W. Winnicott, who was a child psychiatrist in, um, in Britain, um, a uh, sort of working, living and working in the 40s, 50s, and early 60s, mostly contemporary of Anna Freud's, daughter of Sigmund Freud. Um, and Winnicott was a, a, child, a child therapist and a psychoanalyst. And he was the, the first in the psycho, psychoanalytic tradition, or one of the first, to really observe babies, infants, and their mothers. In those days, it was the mothers doing all of the uh, mothering, uh, all of the caretaking. And he was very sensitive, not in a very practical way, by ob actually observing what went on, not just theorizing in a psychoanalytic way. Uh, he was very sensitive to the, uh, the pre-verbal and early verbal rapport and relationship uh, that occurred uh, 
as the young child began to get a sense of his, him or herself and how important the way the mother related to the child's emotions were uh, for the development of a um, uh, coherent uh, or contiguous sense of self. He was very interested in uh, patients who complained of emptiness. And I was always interested in people who complained of emptiness because I felt sort of empty. And then when I went and um, I became a psychiatrist and I was working on an inpatient unit with a lot of so-called borderline patients, one of the big complaints of um, people who are diagnosed as borderline is this, this big feeling of emptiness. Um, so anyway, Winnicott talked about all of this, about when there was a failure in holding there often was a kind of gap in what he called the, the child's going on being. And I even used that phrase, going on being, as a title for a book. And the going to pieces without falling apart also was from Winnicott. So he was very sensitive to how this um, uh, parent, infant, parent-child relationship was the, really the foundation for the development of a healthy emotional life and uh, an ability to have intimacy as an adult. And I think that my, one of the, it's a long answer to your, what you were asking, but I, I think it will all relate. Uh, one of the first pieces that I ever wrote in a psychoanalytic journal, I wrote about um, Freud's attempt to talk about Buddhism as the oceanic feeling, as a return to infantile narcissism. And, um, after that was published, I, I was critiquing that, but also saying there's some truth in that. You know, when you meditate, you actually do uh, experience feelings of early infantile life, you know, of being held by the mother. That is one of the experiences that comes. Only you're not a child, you're not regressing, you're an adult tapping into that feeling. You could as well be the mother or the father tapping into that feeling as the child. You're tapping into that relational truth, really. Um, so after that was published, a psychoanalyst in Soho named Emmanuel Ghent, uh, who I didn't know, but he called me up, uh, ran, he wrote me a letter, uh, it was before email, uh, um, and said, um, have you ever, you sh we should meet. I, I, he, he had been a composer. Uh, he took 20 years off from being a psychoanalyst and worked for Bell Labs. But before that, he'd been in India with Rajneesh. And now he was interested in Buddhism. He was working as a psychoanalyst. And uh, he was into Winnicott, and he told me, we became friends, and he said, you should read Winnicott. You should read this little book by Adam Phillips that's just called Winnicott, that was a biography of Winnicott. And that got me started on uh, appreciating how Buddhist Winnicott was, and realizing that Winnicott had already laid the foundation, in my view anyway, for how to bring Buddhism more into my work as a therapist. Uh, which, which was, Winnicott had this idea that the relationship that, that the therapist establishes, the, what Freud called, uh, like the, Freud talked about it as transference and as the non-objectionable positive transference, you know, because he couldn't just say love, uh, but the, the non-objectionable positive transference was a kind of holding environment, which was Winnicott's term, uh, a place in which the um, forbidden or difficult thoughts, memories, feelings, reflections, dreams, you know, all the stuff that psychoanalysis is made of, that, it, that, that uh, the relationship uh, establishes a safe ground for the experience of uh, all of that stuff, in particular for the re-experience like uh, Jack was talking about in his meditation, you know, of um, uh, feelings of unworthiness, uh, feelings of not being held well enough by the parents, if that wasn't, or else the subjective sense of just something being wrong doesn't necessarily have to be blamed on the parents. But you know, we're all um, uh, individuals from the beginning of our lives and have to cope with being in a body and a mind in this world. And even with the best of parents, it's still a, a kind of lonely business. So, and we all develop defense uh, uh, mechanisms that help us cope. And what therapy is good for is a kind of uncovering of those defense mechanisms. And 
what I have always believed with coming from the Buddhist place is that if you can hold the defenses in the light of awareness, then your need for them starts to be eroded. So you get freed up a little bit. Just seeing your anger or your pain or your rage or your lust or your um, uh, defensiveness, uh, seeing it, especially with the help of another who you, who you basically trust, <coughs> Uh, uh, allows this kind of space that I'm trying to talk about with mindfulness. So that's how I've tried to use it, uh, by trying to uh, find you know, the, the middle ground. The, a whole school of therapy has developed over the past 30 years, uh, a whole school of psychoanalysis called the Relational School of Psychoanalysis, based a lot on Winnicott, that took the the psychoanalytically oriented therapist out of his remote, you know, sitting behind the patient and commenting from on high and sat more face to face, you know, just as another person um, creating a uh, safe place, you know, for conversation. So I, I've always tried to find the middle ground uh, between being myself as myself, as a real person, engaged as a therapist, and, but not imposing myself uh, on the patient's experience because I never really know what's coming next with a given patient. You know, someone could come for a very long time and be, you know, full of material that they want to talk about, but still there's something that they're not telling me or something that hasn't, that they're not even telling themselves. So if I'm, if I'm too much in the way, we'll never get to it, you know. But if I can create just the right amount of space, which I think is analogous to what I'm trying to talk about with mindfulness, like you have to do that for yourself in mindfulness, create enough space for the unknown of the next moment. And I think that that's what a therapist has to do also. So I've tried to deploy it in that way. And I, and I brought along this, this is one of my favorite uh, books of Winnicott's, which sort of like the Dhammapada was, was written for lay people, not for professionals. It, it's called, I think it's still in print, it's called Babies and Their Mothers. And it's uh, a collection of lectures that he gave or radio talks that he gave uh, to, uh, not to other therapists so much as to the general public. He was one of the first to try to bring back breastfeeding, you know, uh, in the 50s when no, when no one was doing it. But he... Thanks for watching, and please be sure to like and subscribe to support the ongoing work of Tibet House US. Happy to like.